Sparrow's Gate, Yorkshire, 6.21 p.m. Dr. Ralph Barlow stared at the barren moor outside the window. The gnarled tree branches looked like skeleton fingers reaching out to him. Dr. Barlow had heard many tales about the moors of Harrow's Gate. Oh my God! He stopped the car just in time. He'd almost ran into the barbed wire roadblock. <gasps> Open your window. <sighs> Dr. Barlow was blinking nervously in the glare of the torchlight. The man was wearing a uniform and a raincoat, and he had a rifle. This is a restricted area. You cannot be here. I'm just... Uh... Turn the car around and leave. Barlow had to think of a lie, and quickly. I'm Dr. Barlow, from London. I'm supposed to... I'm here to take samples. Turn back. I cannot let anyone through. <laughs> My dear boy, I have a written authorization. He opened his glove compartment and grabbed his syringe. It was still full of morphine, for the pain. The pain was almost constant now. Well? Hold on. Ah, here it is. Barlow lunged forward. He stabbed the guard right above the collarbone with his syringe. And then he pressed. The man would be unconscious for hours. Barlow didn't waste any time. He pushed aside the metal barrier and sidled through. The official story was absurd. A terror attack in Yorkshire? Ridiculous. And yet, everywhere he looked, he saw nothing but destruction. Barlow walked up to the edge of a crater. Tombstones were sticking out of the mud at grotesque angles. It was otherworldly. My God. Oh yes, now he knew. A battle had been fought here. A terrible and bloody battle. The vampire graveyard. This is where they buried her body. Simona Grace. They had executed her in the 18th century, but when a group of bioarchaeologists uncovered her grave, all hell broke loose. Suddenly, his muscles gave in. He sank to his knees. It wasn't pain exactly. It was a deep, overpowering exhaustion. The thing inside took everything from him. His strength, his mind, even his sanity. Annie? Grandpa! The memory was as clear as daylight. His granddaughter sitting on his knee. They were playing a game, singing a nursery rhyme. Don't fall down into the mud. If you do, there will be blood. <laughs> Seven months ago, Dr. Ralph Barlow had been diagnosed with leukemia. This is why he had come here, to the vampire graveyard. Yes, it was madness. But ask yourself, what would you do if you were suddenly out of time? When it had passed, when his strength gradually returned, Barlow struggled to get up from the mud. But then, he had staggered too close to the edge of the crater. When he fell, there was nothing to hold on to. He looked up. He saw something in front of him. He reached for it with shivering fingers. What in the world? It had been buried deep in the earth. An upper jawbone. But the molars were extended, like vampire teeth in an old story. It's all true. He feverishly wrapped the bone in a handkerchief and put it in his pocket. Back to London, he thought. Back to the lab. But Dr. Ralph Barlow had no idea what he was about to unleash. There is a darkness that is more than an absence of light. It's a living thing. It takes you completely. My name is John Sinclair. I work for Scotland Yard, Special Division.
Holborn, London, 7.13 a.m. Six weeks ago, I was attacked by a creature in Harrow's Gate. The doctors pronounced me clinically dead. But I didn't die. I crossed over, but I didn't die. I glanced at my face in the bathroom mirror, and then at the two red pills. They looked like rubies in my hands. A specially devised cocktail of painkillers and antibiotics. When I had come back from the other side, I had brought something with me, inside me. It infected my blood, and these pills were all that stood between me and the darkness. I kept staring at my reflection. There was a gleam in my eyes I didn't recognize. A hint of madness. Hyde Park, London, 4.27 p.m. Sinclair! Perkins! What are you doing here? You've doubtlessly noticed that your rifle scope isn't actually attached to the rifle. You don't say. Why are you lying in the grass? It's not illegal, is it? Put down that scope. I'm trying to talk to you. What are you looking at? A lovely pair of tits. I beg your pardon? Here, take the scope. Lie down. And get stains on my dress. I'm sure a gal like you won't mind a few stains. <sighs> Comes with a job. Here. <sighs> Look through the scope. Over there. Do you see them? What? Those birds? Yes, parida. Often simply called chickadee or tit. Native to the northern hemisphere and some parts of Africa. Charming little creatures, don't you think? Hmm. I've heard about your weakness for birds. Can I get up now? Great, my dress is wet. It's onomatopoeic. Tit, I mean. It's what? Onomatopoeic, a word that is derived from its sound. The tittering they make. Fascinating. Sir James sent me. There have been some disturbing reports from Yorkshire. Last I checked, I was off duty, back on Monday. Cancelled. Really? Suddenly I'm needed? Me, of all people? Yes, you. The boys at the yard call you the demon hunter. I suppose I should be flattered. No, you shouldn't. They think you're mad. I am, doing this job for the kind of pay I get. Why are you doing it, then? Let's go. I wouldn't want to keep Sir James waiting. London, the Diogenes Club. 5.37 p.m. Sir James Powell was spending the afternoon at his club. He was trading jokes with the Earl of Prestwick, an alarmingly skinny man who was well past 80 and looked as if he might croak at any moment. However, Sir James's thoughts were on a different matter, a far darker matter. A butler approached him. <clears throat> yes, what is it? Forgive me, sir. There's a... Um, gentlemen and a lady here to see you. They're not club members. Uh, would you excuse me for a moment? They wouldn't let Glenda Perkins and me in. We had to wait in the marble lobby. Mm, posh in here. Don't get excited. We're the help. Nothing more. Ah, Miss Perkins, you brought the prodigal son. Very good. Sir James. You wanted to see me? Wanted is perhaps too strong a word. I need to talk to you. Follow me, both of you. Sir James led us into one of the private rooms of his exclusive gentleman's club. Thick carpets, wood panelled walls. Yes? Where on earth were you? Bird watching. Are you serious? Good for the nerves. You've given me time off, remember? We all make mistakes. Here. What's this? It's a dossier I've been working on. Rather late hours, too. Your new case, Sinclair. Someone has been uh, investigating a certain cemetery in Yorkshire that you blew up. The vampire graveyard? I thought it was off limits to civilians. Indeed it is. The local constabulary sent me this picture. Dr. Ralph Barlow. If I'm not mistaken, he's the man who treated you at St. Bartholomew's. Yes, I had a feeling about him. He injected the man guarding the site with morphine. They're expecting him to make a full recovery, but Barlow is missing. Why would he visit the vampire graveyard? Why, indeed. When our men combed the town, we found a book. 
The Diary of Reverend Jeremiah Worthington. Sounds riveting. Quite so. It's the only existing account of the vampire outbreak in Yorkshire in 1786. Rather informative. Reverend Worthington thought he was dealing with a plague sent from hell. It could happen again. And I'm afraid that the good doctor has no idea what kind of powers he's playing with. The sun was going down, and there was a light evening rain. The streets were glistening. Glenda Perkins and I were on our way to Special Division. I was driving. I liked to be in charge. I entered the underground car park and killed the engine. Home sweet home. <sighs> Let's do this, Sinclair. Oh, before I forget, Sir James insisted I give you this. A gift? From Sir James? I'm a little touched, I must say. Don't get too excited. Nice watch. Made in Switzerland. How sweet. Chocolates would have sufficed. Oh, this is even sweeter. Put your finger here. Can you hear me? Why, hello. A radio. This way, I'll always be close to you. A dream come true. Let's go. St. Bartholomew's Hospital, London, 6.42 p.m. Barlow was shivering. He felt weak. He'd been driving all night. The police were probably looking for him by now. He had slept for a few hours in the back of his car. Then he had come to the hospital. The night shift had not yet arrived, and he hoped to be undisturbed. He stumbled into the lab. He put the jawbone down and looked at it. Then he opened the fridge door. This was where the blood samples and laboratory specimens were kept. Where is it? With shivering fingers, he searched for the right one. Where is it? Then he found it. The sample labeled JS209. It all added up. The vampire graveyard, the jawbone, his mysterious patient six weeks ago, John Sinclair. The man had died in front of his eyes. He saw it and he had seen him come back from the dead and all too soon he would be gone as well but he wasn't ready to go all he wanted was a little more time he held a small glass vial up to his table lamp the red liquid seemed to be glowing he looked at the jawbone is this what i could turn into he wondered it was dangerous he had no idea what to expect but he was a scientist after all, wasn't he? What did he have to lose? He found a syringe and attached it to the vial. Then he rolled up his sleeve. The needle entered his skin. He pushed. And then he watched as John Sinclair's blood entered his body. Oh God! The effect was sudden. His heart was beating faster. He felt a cold shiver run down his spine. And at that moment, oh God. Oh God. he knew that he had made a mistake. Oh. Scotland Yard, London, 7.21 p.m. It was time to get ready. Miss Perkins took me to the armory in the basement of the building. The walls were lined with weapons, anything from handguns to assault rifles. Perkins picked up a small metal box. Oh, no. Your Beretta 92. Is it loaded? You'll be surprised. Silver bullets. A whole magazine. Standard issue from now on. I convinced management that we needed the right tools for the job. Make sure to bring the empty casings for your monthly expense report, and always save at least one bullet. For what? For yourself. How very considerate. She came closer to me. You're not just any man, you know. Your skills, your knowledge. I'm sure there are others who would love to get their hands on you. So if you need to spend some silver, even on yourself, remember, you're worth it. Perkins. Ah, oh, thank you, officer. 
Is the honeymoon over already? Oh, it's only just beginning. The call had come from one of our patrol cars. Sir James had put out a nationwide alert with Barlow's picture. Someone had seen him at St. Bartholomew's. I was on my way to the hospital. St. Bartholomew's Hospital, London, 8.19 p.m. Hello? Are you quite all right in there? No, he wasn't. His skin was burning. The fever, it seemed, was eating him alive. He grabbed his head in pain. He pulled out a long strand of hair, and there was blood. What was happening to him? Dr. Barlow? His face was pale and grotesquely distorted. He was lying in the corner of his office. Oh my God! Doctor! She rushed towards him. Here, let me! No. I'm just going to feel your pulse. His skin was hot to the touch. This was no ordinary sickness. I need some assistance, please. Right away, lab 512. No! Don't worry, Doctor. Someone will be here shortly. What was that now? Go away. Don't worry. I'm, I'm too... You'll be just fine. Dangerous. Oh, how sweet her blood smelled. So enticing. Please! Please! Nonsense! I'll stay with you until the bitter... He couldn't stop himself. He tried. God, how he tried. But the scent of her blood, it was overpowering. Normally, the metamorphosis from Homo sapiens to Lamia Nocturna takes several hours, sometimes even days. But John Sinclair's blood was very powerful. His teeth hadn't fully developed yet, which is why it was so... Exquisitely painful when he tore at the young woman's skin, her tender throat, and there it was, her sweet, hot blood. He bent down and licked the drops off the white tiles. What's going on here? The thing, the beast, formerly known as Ralph Barlow, was crouched over. His face, his white lab coat splattered with fresh blood. Barlow leapt forward. He pushed the men aside hard. They fell over like toys. Barlow stumbled past them into the neon-lit corridor. Every sound was amplified. The light burned his eyes. Hey, stop! Barlow ran away from them all, away from the lights. Suddenly, a policeman was standing in front of him. Barlow lunged towards the man. He grabbed him, lifted him up, and threw him at the window. St. Bartholomew's Hospital. I remembered it well, too well. This is where my ordeal began. Where are you, Sinclair? I switched off the radio and raised the watch up. I'm at the hospital now, looking for parking. Shoot to kill. That's an order. I heard glass shattering somewhere. And then, one second later, something came crashing. The body of a policeman was lying in the road. His skull was cracked open, and the blood poured out in a thick wave. I looked up. The window on the fifth floor was broken. People were flocking out of the hospital entrance. I could see fear on their faces. I pulled my gun and fought my way through the crowd into the hospital. I found the staircase and bounded up two steps at a time. When I reached the fifth floor, I stopped for a brief moment and listened. I slowly pushed open the door. There was a cool wind. The large window at the end of the hallway was shattered. The sound had come from one of the rooms. I pressed myself against the wall. Then, my gun in both hands, I took a step forward and turned, pointing the weapon in the room. The lights were out. A young man was lying in a hospital bed. Everyone else had fled. Not him. His leg was in a cast. Please help me. In the murky darkness of the room, the creature looked almost human. 
But when I looked more closely, Barlow, my God, he glared at me, and something, something passed between us. His eyes were bloodshot, and his pupils had a yellow glow. I cocked my gun. All I needed to do was squeeze the trigger. It would be so easy. But what if I missed? The patient was right between me and the creature. Barlow jumped out of the window. I looked outside. Barlow had landed on a flat awning, one floor below. I swung my feet out of the window and jumped. I tried to roll over my shoulder, but the drop had been too steep. Pain shot through my right arm. I ran to the edge. He was gone. All I saw was the city. It seemed so peaceful in the moonlight. Hampstead Heath, London, 7.16 a.m. the next morning. I was told that Barlow was suffering from leukemia. He didn't have much longer to live, and perhaps he was trying to reach for immortality. He had injected himself with my blood. I could feel his presence somewhere, but I didn't know where he was. According to our case file, Barlow has a daughter, Eleanor Barlow, age 35. She has a seven-year-old girl, Annie. We need you to- Got it. Goodbye. Come on, sweetie, you're late for practice. I don't want to go. You wanted ballet classes, not me, princess. Miss Barlow? What do you want? I'm DCI John Sinclair, Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard? <laughs> Don't worry, you're not in any trouble. Do you mind if I ask you a few questions? I'm sorry, um, what, what is this about, please? It's about your father, Ralph Barlow. I suggest you talk to him then. I'd like to, but we don't know his whereabouts. I was hoping you might be able to help us. I'm afraid I can't. I sense some hostility here. Mummy, who is this man? He's a policeman. He won't be long. Listen, Mr... Sinclair. Mr. Sinclair, I haven't spoken to my father in years. He's not exactly what you'd call an involved parent. Miss Barlow, <clears throat> it's rather important. We have reason to believe that your father may be... He may be suffering from a terminal illness. We have to find him. Terminal? Leukemia. I, I had no idea. Won't you help us find him, please? I... I wish I could. I just... I don't know where he is. I'm sorry. I can't help you. Scotland Yard, London, 10.39 a.m. You disobeyed a direct order! I was in Sir James's office, and Glenda Perkins was giving me a talking to. Sir James simply sat back in his comfortable chair with his tea and enjoyed the show. We both fell silent. We looked at Sir James. He sipped his tea. You're a good soldier, Sinclair. I know that. And I appreciate your uh, sentimentality. But we can't afford weakness. It's not weakness. If we're not fighting for our values, what are we fighting for? You are familiar with the weir, I take it? Yes, of course. A bird native to the North Island of New Zealand. Black plumage with an orange spot around the beak. Mm. Lovely creatures. Have you ever seen one? In the Natural History Museum, they're extinct. Killed off by a rather nasty predatory species. Humans. Indeed. Now it's our turn to face extinction. This isn't a war like the ones you or I fought in. This is genocide. These creatures won't stop until they've eradicated each and every one of us. You know that. I need to be able to count on you. And I need you to do the right thing. The right thing? Not always easy to see what that is. Good day. Sinclair, wait! It was windy today. I stared at the waves roiling the Thames. I always liked to walk here. The grey water was soothing to me. John? Ah, 
you again. Why didn't you shoot him? You had no problem killing the others up in Harrow's Gate. I suppose you have a theory. I do. It's not the civilian. It's because you're one of them, on some level. He can get into your mind. <laughs> when I was a child, I watched my mother die of cancer. In fact, I almost killed her. I know. It's in your file. On the day she died, I wasn't there with her. I refused to go to the hospital. It felt as if, by going, I would be admitting that she's at the end. And, and I couldn't do that. So I never... I never said goodbye to her. And I'll always carry that with me. It's one thing if you only see them after what they've become. But Barlow, he was a man with hopes and dreams like everyone else. That's been taken from him. He's killed a nurse. Sir James is right. We cannot afford this kind of sentimentality. Come with me. There's something I need you to see. Welcome to Control. Control. The beating heart of Special Division. The squad room was crowded. It smelled faintly of sweat. Our support team. Every one of these men is counting on you to do your job. Everyone here has a family they want to protect. Barlow made his choice. What's yours? <clears throat> All right, everybody, listen up. DCI Sinclair's back on active duty. Little earlier than expected. We have a tactical situation. She walked past several desks towards the far end of the squad room. A large map of London was pinned to a wall. As some of you may know, DCI Sinclair has recently suffered a blood infection up in Yorkshire. Bloody Yorkshire. <laughs> we have reason to believe that the attending physician at St. Bart's has deliberately injected himself with samples of Mr. Sinclair's blood. That's the worst idea I've ever heard of. The alcohol content alone will kill you. <laughs> what do you want to do that for? Why indeed? Using a remote, she dimmed the lights in the room and projected a slide onto the scoreboard. We saw Dr. Ralph Barlow smiling at us. Still human, at least in the photograph. Dr. Barlow was diagnosed with leukemia seven months ago. Inoperable. We suspect he's been trying desperate measures to increase his lifespan. By turning himself into a vampire? Well, I don't think Barlow understood what he signed up for what it's really like. As you know, he attacked one of the nurses at Bart's. Fatal, I'm afraid. Is she going to... I mean, if you're killed by a... You know. Is she going to turn? No, we, uh, <clears throat> we took care of that. Barlow, however, managed to escape. Right now, he's most likely hiding from the daylight. He's still in the early stages of his transformation, but it appears to be happening at an accelerated pace. Why? We don't know why. Any idea where he might be? None whatsoever. Barlow and I share a bond. He's used my blood. In a sense, I am his... his father. So you can feel where he is? It doesn't work like that. I need to be close. I can't just go driving around London. We're talking eight million people here. I got up and walked over to the map of London. Using a red marker, I drew a circle around St. Bartholomew's. The transformation is painful. I don't think he went very far. Remember, he's in a weakened state, at least until his metamorphosis is complete. If that happens, we'll be dealing with a fully mature Lamia Nocturna, which means a potential level four outbreak. Vampires in London, ladies and gentlemen. There's a beast on the loose, and we are going to kill it. Ah, that thing could be anywhere. No, not just anywhere. He's sensitive to daylight, so he's going to be hiding. He needs darkness. The tube, perhaps? Too crowded. Until the transformation is complete, he's rather vulnerable. Any kind of storeroom or storage room or a warehouse? Possible. We're considering a three-mile radius from St. Bart's. I don't think he would have run very far. He has two primary objectives. Finding shelter and... And? Finding... Finding food. Take a look at this. I walked up to the map and stared closely at St. Bartholomew's Hospital. 
Then, my gaze went up. What is it? Right there. Just half a mile from the hospital. Smithfield Market. So? It's the largest meat market in England. It's going to smell of blood. Get ready, boys. I want roadblocks from Farringdon Road to St John Street. I want the entire market area choked off. Put snipers on the rooftops here, uh, here and here. You heard the lady. Let's go, let's go, let's go! Smithfield Market, London. 4.17 a.m. Morning, Alfred. <coughs> you all right? Oh, fine. Just a cold. To be in bed, you know. What's going on here? You see that helicopter? Oh, coppers are probably just bored. The Smithfield Market opens every morning at 4 a.m. That's when the vans from the nearby traders come in with the fresh meat for the day. The market was a vast, cathedral-like structure of cast iron stone and ornate Victorian glass. Alfred Bennett worked for Malcolm and Donald Bain, a local supplier. Right now, he was pushing a large blue plastic bin down a stone corridor underneath the market towards one of the coolers. The inside of the bin was full of cow parts, neatly wrapped in plastic. Sides, ribs, legs. He opened the gate to the cooling storage, lot 39. He turned on the light. Oh my God! The thing inside lot 39 barely looked human in the light of the neon bulbs. Its head almost completely fallen out. The jaw was elongated. The skin was pale, and its eyes shone like dark amber. It was covered in blood, sucking on the innards of a cow. Let's go. Perkins and the snipers touched down on the roof of a nearby building. Take your positions. Get your rifles ready. Yes, ma'am. Meanwhile, I made my way to the crime scene. What have we got? We've sealed off all the entrances. We've got roadblocks on all the corners. Good. I'm going in. I slowed down as I approached the loading dock. I pulled my Beretta. I pressed myself against a wall and carefully peeked around a corner. I saw a van parked by the gate, and a sign above it that read, Dead Slow. Very funny. Sinclair, report. I raised my watch up higher. I'm at the loading dock. Someone's screaming. Be careful. If he's feeding, he might easily go into a blood frenzy. Your concern is touching. Perhaps when all this is over, we can have dinner together. I don't believe in workplace romance. I wasn't talking about romance. Let's talk later, honey. Don't call me honey. The gate at the loading dock was half open. I entered the market. It was cool in there. The only sound was the buzzing of the refrigeration units. I could smell the blood all around me. And then, I could feel him. He was close. I took a staircase down to the storage area in the basement. He was close. So close. My God, those screams. I moved along the wall, my gun in both hands. I must have stepped in something. I looked down. The sole of my shoe was dripping with blood. My gaze followed the trail of red to a metal door on my right. I could see blood oozing through the crack underneath. I carefully touched the metal with my fingertips. All right, then. I reached for the handle. Barlow. He was barely recognizable. He looked monstrous. He was crouched over his victim. A man in his forties, lying on his back. The floor was covered with blood. His stomach had been ripped open and his intestines were exposed, glistening red and purple in the semi-dark. Help me. Help me. He was still alive. 
stop! It's over! I shot, but at that moment he lunged at me. The shot missed him. He knocked me down, then raced past me. I was about to go after him, but he needed my help. I looked at the poor man. His stomach was in shreds. It was only a matter of minutes now. I raised my watch. Perkins, come in. What's going on? I'm in the supply basement underneath the food stalls. Barlow got away. He's moving north. I'm with a victim. He's... He's still alive. Barely. I need an ambulance. Roger that. Oh, my hand. Please tell Claire. My wife. Tell her I love her. What is that? I give you my word. He died while I was holding his hand. Before he did, he told me to take his wedding ring and give it to his wife. When the paramedics arrived, it was over. All they could do was bag the body and take it out. I looked at his ring for a moment, then put it in my pocket. All exits have been sealed off. We have men at the checkpoints. Sinclair? Yes, ma'am. You know what you have to do. Yes, ma'am. In the 19th century, the livestock used to be brought to the market through underground tunnels, still alive, to be slaughtered on sight. I had my gun in my hand and carefully made my way down into the darkness. I was leading a small group of three soldiers, the search team. In my left hand, I held a torch. Then I heard something. What was that? One of the men at the checkpoints. Let's go! The screams had come from one of the access tunnels. We ran. Oh, oh my god! Too oh, late. God. Perkins, two men down. Their throats are torn out. Must have been Barlow. He... I looked up. I could feel rain on my face. He must have overwhelmed the lads at the checkpoint, climbed up the ladder, and pushed open the metal trap door. I rushed up the stairs. Barlow was free. A beast was loose. Cars were crashing into each other. People were running around in a panic. And then I saw him. In the middle of all this carnage. Some people tried to stop him. A man in a business suit tackled him. Barlow tore into him with his teeth and claws. I was seeing a predator take down the easiest prey. I aimed my gun. One bullet missed by inches. The other went into his left leg and out the car. Barlow, no! He stumbled backward, into the path of an oncoming bus. The bus driver wrestled the wheel around, but the double-decker lost its balance. It fell over to the side, burying two cars under it. He was running down Cowcross Street. I sprinted after him. Barlow! Barlow! It's over, Barlow! You can't get away! I heard helicopters overhead. I scanned the neighboring buildings. There! I could see our snipers on the rooftops. Their searchlights flooded the streets with a bright white light. It hurt his eyes. The snipers were aiming at him, but he was too fast. I kept on running. The snipers were pushing him ahead, cutting off his escape routes. A middle-aged woman, probably on her way to work, was trying to run past the creature. Barlow lunged at her. I waited until I had a clear shot. My bullet missed his head by inches. I couldn't get a clean shot. There were too many civilians. His claw hands reached for her. He sank his razor-sharp teeth into her throat. The bullet grazed his shoulder. He let go of his victim. The snipers took their shots, but they couldn't pin him down. He ran away, blending into the shadows. He turned right into a small back alley, a cul-de-sac. I knew he was there. I could feel him. You know how this ends, don't you? With your death. I held my gun out with two hands, but suddenly, his claw swiped across my side, tearing off skin and muscle. He leapt at me, knocking the gun out of my hand. And the next moment he was on me, his teeth were coming closer, closer. Father. He let go of me. I looked up and saw a helicopter standing on the rooftop next to us. Our boys were shooting at him. He jumped, then he quickly climbed up a metal staircase towards the rooftop. I grabbed my gun and ran after him. I reached the roof. The soldiers were dead. 
Only two of them had made it back to the helicopter. They had dropped their rifles. Barlow stumbled towards the helicopter. The door was open. I couldn't shoot. I couldn't risk hitting the fuselage. The soldiers tried to close the cargo door, but it was too late. Barlow crawled inside as the bird lifted up. I jumped. My hands grabbed the landing bar, and the helicopter moved upwards with a jerky motion. I nearly lost my grip. I managed to swing my leg over the bar. I could see London below me. I hoisted myself inside. Barlow tore the soldier's ribcage open. The pilot looked over his shoulder in terror. Barlow glared at me. I kicked him hard. We were flying above the Thames by now. Barlow recovered. Then he grabbed the pilot's head with both hands. With one swift motion, he broke his neck. The helicopter went into a nosedive. I threw myself at the beast. We were 20 feet above the ground any second now. Suddenly, Barlow let go of me. I could see the black waters of the Thames below us. Barlow threw me off and lunged out of the open door. I saw him vanish. I went after him into the darkness. I went under. Then I started struggling. When I came up, I saw the helicopter crashing into the river. I couldn't feel Barlow, but I knew he was still alive. He could have killed me. I don't know why he didn't, but I remember what he said. Father. And then I knew he was looking for his family. Hampstead Heath, London. Good morning. It's seven o'clock, and we're looking at a cloudy day with intermittent rain. In latest news, police report that a wild animal had broken free near Smithfield Market last night and caused mass panic. Police have cordoned the entire area off, traffic is jammed, and there's a tailback. Oh no. Eleanor Barlow had overslept. Not good. She had to be at the office in an hour and she had to make sure her daughter was ready for school. Annie, time to get up, please. Annie, sweetie. Get up, baby. You've got a maths exam today. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Come on, put your clothes on, and don't forget to brush your teeth. All right, all right. Eleanor went into the kitchen to make some coffee. The sky outside was dark and overcast. The radio had mentioned rain. Yes, sweetheart. Can you come here? I need help with my jacket. Eleanor entered the living room. Annie was standing in front of the large bay windows, struggling with a zipper on her coat. I can't get it closed. Hold on. Eleanor went down on her knees in front of Annie. Both of them, mother and daughter, looked at the zipper. Oh, why isn't it? Neither of them noticed the dark, monstrous shape that rose up outside the window. <laughs> The creature was pale and hairless. Its teeth looked like those of a hyena, and its eyes, a bottomless darkness shone in those yellow eyes. And yet... Grandpa? Get away from her! She clutched her daughter close to her. The creature extended its arm. Its fingers were like talons. Let me touch you, my angel. No! Giddy up, giddy up, on that Oh my god, please! Let her go, oh god, please! Please, God! I kicked in the door and made my way inside, my gun drawn. Let go of her! She's my granddaughter, my one and only. I said let go! I had no clear shot. The creature was clutching the child. I just wanted to, to smell her hair one last time. Oh my God, please, let her go. Oh, oh God, she please. smells so good, so sweet. No, please, Annie, darling. Hello. Please give her Do back. Do the right please. thing. For a moment, his grip on the child loosened. Suddenly, the girl bit into his hand hard, and then she was free. Annie! Barlow's eyes were blazing red. I knew that look. The blood frenzy. Suddenly, the cloud cover lifted and the sun burst through the open window. Its rays hit Barlow. And then I saw flames on his back. 
His body started to burn. It was now or never. I'm sorry. And then I spent some silver. My bullet hit him right between the eyes. Blood, brain tissue, and pieces of his skull were sprayed all over the room. Eleanor was clutching her daughter. It was over. The beast was dead. But something in my mouth tasted like ash. I stumbled over to the sofa and sank down onto it. You wouldn't happen to have some coffee. Then I closed my eyes. Darkness came over me. Southwark, London, 8 a.m. Mrs. Bennett, DCI Sinclair. We spoke on the phone. Yes. It's about your husband, Alfred Bennett. Uh, he's, a... he's... I know. I was with him when he died. He wanted me to give you this. He's waiting for me. He said to tell you... You see, not everyone has the chance to say this while there's still time. He... He said you were the love of his life. Those were his last words. I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you. For what? For doing this. It was the right thing. Not always easy to see what that is. Goodbye. The rain and gloom of London was waiting for me. That and all my nightmares. John Sinclair, Demon Hunter, Episode 9, To Kill a Beast. Audio movie by Gabriel Conroy, based on the original novel by Jason Dark. John Sinclair was played by Andrew Wincott. The narrator was Anthony Scordy. Glenda Perkins was Jess Robinson. Sir James Powell was David Rintoul. Dr. Ralph Barlow was Neil Dudgeon. And Eleanor Barlow was Alex Wilton Regan. The nurse was played by Leanne Rose Bunce. Alfred Bennett was Brian Deacon. Mrs. Bennett was Ali Dowling. Lowry was Ian Wood. And Annie was played by Laurence Bovard. The guard was played by Joseph Sumner. Radio by Ian Dickinson. The officer was Matt Littler. And the butler was played by Nico Lennon. This was recorded between December 2015 and March 2016 at OMUK Studios London and Iglo Music Los Angeles. The recording engineers were Juan Manuel Delphine in London and Jay Markovitz in LA. The voice director was Douglas Welbat. The creative director was Patrick Simon and the casting consultant was Victoria Prentice. The executive producer was Mark Zipper. Post-production took place at Ear 2 Brain Productions. A Bastai Entertainment production, all rights reserved. <laughs>